Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're not due to start yet. We've got a couple of minutes. We have three minutes before we start. And our guess up here is that this is about as many people who are going to turn up. And we're not presenting with slides. And this is a lab on labs. And so we're really cognizant of being a bunch of talking heads and how boring that is. So we're going to rearrange the room a little bit and make it more of a, I don't know, like a forum, if you will. We're going to try and do it in the round, because I think there's about the right number of people, which I think will also change the dynamic um, and make it more interesting. So this is like totally obnoxious, and it's the thing the white guy does, which is sort of mansplained to you all, and I apologize for that in advance. Um, can you just put up your hand if you have worked in a museum like lab or are currently working in a museum like lab. Okay, so about a third. Okay, so if you just put up your hand then, you gotta sit in this quadrant. And if you're not, um, yeah, yeah, exactly, that's right. We're gonna do um, a data visualization of where you're sitting. So if you're not in a lab and you've never worked in a lab and you're in this segment, you need to leave this segment. You need to find somewhere else to sit. This is really odd and I apologize in advance. But we just wanna make it, we, we're just going to divide the room up a little bit. Yeah, it's going to, I'm, Doing this is going to force you to put your laptops away as well. I apologize for that in advance. You may need to pay attention for an hour. I also apologize for that. OK. Oh, this is going to be fun. I'm going to enjoy this more than you will. OK. Um, so, so you can see like the distinction. So people who are coming in, if you've ever worked in a lab or you're currently working in a museum-like lab or a lab-like institution within a museum, you're sitting in this quadrant. Yeah, exactly right. Thank you for, so you're okay if you're not, but if you are in the lab, you've got to be in this section. This, yeah, this is, our, this is our pie chart. Okay, okay, okay. All right, so then if you are in a small to medium museum, so a museum with less than 400 employees. If you're in a museum with less than 400 employees, you're in that section back there. Look at this, people are like, ah, oh, God damn it. No, 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 you're okay, you're okay. It's, you're in two. Yeah, that's okay, labs stay here, small to medium here, large here. Including casual staff. Frontline staff are still staff. Store staff are still staff. Security is still staff. They count. They are people. They are humans. Okay. Yeah? Questions? No, no, no. You're good. Yeah, yeah. Lab type stuff. That, that. <laughs> okay. Sorry? No, no. Okay. That. That is what we're going to spend the next hour on. I am not going to answer for you in a sentence. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll all go. <laughs> okay, that's really helpful. Okay, so um, if you want to stand up, you can stand up. But if, if not, just sit and look around and just get a sense of the scale. Okay, so even on the panel, we've got small to medium. We've got some people are in a lab. Some people are not in a lab but do lab-like stuff. And we're going to be exploring what that means and the sort of diversity across that. We, <laughs> I'm most probably going to ask you to do this again in about half an hour because... <laughs> It's really important. The only thing I've learned so far in this conference, apart from that you guys drink a lot, is the more that you make the sessions interactive, the more you get out of it, and the chalk and talk just sort of flows in and out of the brain. So bear with me. This will be more fun. We'll get more out of it if we take this approach. So we're, we're right on time. We're going to do some introductions. Do you want to start? This one work? No? <laughs> Does this one work? Okay, I'll stick with this one. Um, all right, uh, so welcome here, everyone. Um, my name's Aaron Ambrosiani, and I'm not in a lab. Um, I'm at the Nordic Museum in Stockholm, Sweden, which is a cultural, institu uh, cultural history museum, um, around 150 people on staff. and. Um, my department is called Digital Interaction, so it's one of these sort of digital um, departments that exist in different ways around the museum world. Um, and the department came to being as a kind of 
way to internally get buy-in on do actually doing digital stuff. So the director at the museum invented a new department and hired one person, and then that person had to figure out who else to bring on board from the existing staff. Um, so we're five people now out of these 150. Um, so that might be my introduction. That's pretty good. <clears throat> Hello. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm Sam Tegner. I'm a creative technologist at the Innovation Studio here in Pittsburgh um, for the four uh, museums that make up the Carnegie Institute. Um, so I'm on a, a currently four-person team. It's pretty small, and we work on a lot of different um, aspects of projects. I'm a creative technologist, which means I'm split between uh, design and development but the job does require us to uh, even branch beyond those things. So yeah, a couple of our team members are now even doing 3D modeling. We do illustration, stuff like that. So all kinds of stuff. It's really fun. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Patrick Cavanaugh. I'm a software developer with the New Fields Lab. It's formerly the IMA Lab, uh, Indianapolis Museum of Art. It's an exciting place in that this is actually the third generation of the lab, or the third iteration. And so we've received institutional support throughout all those processes. Um, Rob Stein originally created it over a decade ago, um, and currently Stuart Alter is our director of technology. And it came from above. I mean, if any of you were at the Ignite talk, you saw how we kind of lost a previous director and lost a lot of our um, staff. So we've rebuilt it to its current full size, um, four developers, um, full stack engineers basically, uh, a designer, a digital asset manager, and then our director. So we're excited to be fully staffed again and have the institutional support to kind of drive that forward and to um, work on both internal and external facing projects. Cool. <coughs> uh, so my name is Keir Winesmith. I'm the head of digital at SFMOMA. And at SFMOMA we have a thing called SFMOMA Lab. So it's got a name, it's got a brand. And um, I'm going to tell you two anecdotes, and then we're going to get into more of a um, sort of shared discussion. So the first anecdote is about where SFMOMA Lab came from. And so San Francisco, you know, uh, as I mentioned in other, other forums, to be in San Francisco, be the SF MoMA and not another MoMA, you want to be connected with your community. You want to be relevant to your community. And so the SF in SF MoMA is very much around uh, a contemporary changing landscape that is very much invested in technology and quote unquote innovation. So we're not necessarily in the business of disruption or pivoting or other buzzwords, but we're absolutely in the, in the business of being relevant to our community. And so uh, when I joined SFMOMA, one of the things that we did uh, soon after that was um, institute SFMOMA Lab. And the way that we did that, and it's one of the labs in the model of there's no physical it has no physical manifestation. There isn't a room, um, students can't attend, there are no widgets, um, it's, it's actually a notebook. So that, that needs to be explained. Um, so we, we needed notebooks and it turned out getting a notebook with lines so that you could do sketches um, was a little bit more complicated, it wasn't in the normal notebook set, so we asked for a different notebook and for free, you could have something embossed on it, cost the same amount. So we had all of our notebooks for my team have SFMOMA R&D on it. And we would take that to meetings with um, members of the technology community, um, so startups, uh, established technology companies, and we would just kind of like lay it on the table. Okay, so I'm part of SFMOMA R&D. I mean, you guys have an R&D lab, right? Yeah, I mean, we do, look, look we got notebooks. Um, <laughs> the, the notebooks then became a fetish object amongst curators and, and conservators and other colleagues, and um, there's, there's about, 20 of them floating around Adobe at the moment. There's some down at Oculus, Facebook have a few. Um, then after about a year of SFMOMA R&D as a notebook, we changed the notebooks to SFMOMA Lab because it's a real thing now, because I've said it a lot. Um, <laughs> and so the, now there's, there's a whole bunch of SFMOMA Lab notebooks floating around the museum. Anyone gonna have one? We print, we print them whenever anyone's interested, whenever we run out. And so the lab became a thing, uh, became a thing that we used to work out different tempos, to work out different paces. Primarily, that was the role of the lab. It was an excuse to do work outside of the, the normal 
temporalities that a museum implies, which is hundreds of years for objects. You know, when you're thinking about conservation, you're thinking, will this, the act that I make now keep this object alive for the next 200 years? Like, that's the timeline. When you're thinking about exhibitions, planning is three to five, execution is one to three. Um, and for a technology group within, oh, sorry, an innovation group within a, in a museum context, you can't work on those timelines and be effective. So it gave us a language for experimentation. It gave us an excuse to do things that only took a short amount of time to um, invent, deliver, and then kill. Um, but it also gave us, and I think this is the most effective thing living in San Francisco, it gave us an opportunity to, to begin a set of partnerships with other labs that are like legit labs with employees and places <laughs> and staff and that sort of thing. And so what that's taught us as an organization is that we're actually good if we practice and we're intentional about it at, at, at working at different tempos and creating things at different scale. So uh, Send Me SF MoMA, uh, which Jay talked about yesterday, uh, is part of SF MoMA Lab. The API was something we invented for an event, for a pop-up, for, for an, uh, like a, um, a hackathon, I guess, and a series of other things. Um, some of our some of our most successful projects, um, which have had hundreds of thousands, or in the case of, of SEMI-SF moment, millions of users have come because we time-boxed it. This is a thing we're going to do within a week, or this is a thing we're going to do within a month, or because we've made a relationship with an organization that we couldn't get access to before we had a language that they spoke. And so we were very intentional about why the lab existed, and we've been pretty consistent with how we've done it, and we've been really generous with how we've <coughs> published that. And so when you're thinking about these uh, ways of working institutionally, start with the reason why you're doing it and, and step away from the sort of the fetish of the, of the lab. So, um, the, so the notebook is, is one anecdote. And then the second anecdote is how the four of us got together. So um, Rob Stein, as uh, Patrick mentioned, um, began IMA Labs and is now an AAM and has started the Alliance Labs. <clears throat> so in, he and I were arguing about what labs mean on Twitter and I was like, well, let's do this in front of other people <laughs> at MCN. And he was like, that's great, but, but we're just going to agree largely. We need to find someone who won't agree with us. And so we're like, Shelley Bernstein, that's perfect. She won't agree with us. And so the three of us decided we should do this. And then we're like, oh, no, we're, we've kind of been doing this a while. We need someone who's new and is going to learn, uh, who's just learning how this means and will challenge our kind of established assumptions. So we invited Samantha to join us. Um, and then because it's a lab thing and it's all about iteration and, and incremental improvement, Rob then quickly had to do something else and disappeared. And so <laughs> Aaron joined us because we wanted a European perspective. And then last week, Shelley had something come up and she couldn't come. So Patrick joined us as of, I think, Thursday last week. And so that's actually, we sort of, we've sort of done the iterative development of a panel. <laughs> um, live as you learn. Yeah, yeah, live as you learn um, at, at, in the lab model um, of, you know, every time something is removed, you get to add something in that is then a better shape for the thing that then w that it was before. So it's about puzzle pieces, in my opinion. So, um, so two anecdotes, sort of two approaches to labs. And so what we were going to quickly just say, and then and really we're just going to go essentially like straight into Q&A and make this a really kind of open discussion, is we're going to try and sum up in a couple of sentences, n not ourselves, but what, what our lab actually does in a kind of practical sense inside our organization who it's for, what its audience is, what's the kind of model, because um, there's a series of models. And then I'm going to kind of sum up what I see as the spectrum of, of this sort of work in a, in a museum context. And then we're going to go to the floor, if that makes sense. Is that, is that all good? OK. Do you want to start? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can start. <coughs> so um, the innovation studio uh, here, let's see, what, <laughs> what do we do? Um, what do we do? <laughs> It's hard to kind of, you know, de describe it because I think we're, like, inventing it as we go. Um, but there are, like, some strict ideas that we stick to. And one is actually kind of, like, um, something that you wouldn't normally hear in a lab and uh, something that we all have sort of agreed on, like, failure is actually not an option for us. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. So we work on stuff uh, that is real and that we think that the museum needs or, or things that they even tell us that they need. Um, so they can come to us with ideas or an exhibit they want to mount and look, they want some digital or interactive pieces with that. So uh, we kind of 
take over that, that side of things and let the exhibits team do what they're really good at, which is um, you know, providing educational content, planning the space, even like building enclosures for like the screens that we'll, we'll build, stuff like that. Um, and then we come in kind of as experts uh, in interactivity and des uh, digital design. Uh, so that's how we're working now. And most of our projects, uh, I think we've received some sort of prompt and only when we're kind of like in a, maybe we've just wrapped something up, um, then we get a little bit of time to experiment and come up with our own ideas. And uh, luckily, as we're building the trust with the museums, providing them projects that they you know, like and ask for, uh, then with the projects that we come up with, I think they're more receptive to work with us because we've, we've been working with them. So I guess that's how it's working out for us. All right, so um, before I mention that we, we have a balance of internal facing projects and external facing projects, um, and it's a delicate balance. The interesting thing was um, external facing projects earn revenue. We can go out and we can, you know, most recently we've provided the online collections for the Virginia Historical Society, for the Mariners Museum, and so those are great contracts that we can get. And um, at the same time, though, it, it is that delicate balance because you don't want to neglect your institution, your museum, but those don't necessarily pay. So the, the model for that is, is interesting because we ha are trying to infuse ourselves in those, you know, the exhibition redesigns or the interactives or just infusing digital into some of these in-house experiences a lot earlier on. So it's like, hey, here we are, we are the lab, you can use us as a resource and we can participate in the brainstorming process a lot earlier. So that's kind of where we've tried to um, go as we've become more fully staffed and we're able to handle these external projects and internal projects. So for instance, we're doing um, you know, a VR experience and a new um, redesign of our design gallery. Uh, also, you, you know, interactive uh, painting applications for a star studio, which is kind of a K through four um, children's exhibition. So those are, those are the, we're trying to reestablish our rapport with our internal audience because we are doing a lot of external projects, but at the same time keeping that, the nice thing about the external projects, um, such as uh, you know, American Art Collaborative, is we, we get to interact with a lot of different institutions and put ourselves out there as, a, as giving back as well as um, you know, providing a service. So it's, yeah, understanding what that balance is. Yeah, we're gonna get we're gonna get into monetization in a big way in a little bit. Aaron, did you get a? Mm -hmm. um, so as I as I mentioned earlier, we we are not a lab at the Nordic Museum, um, but I'm here because we worked together with the lab, uh, the Innovation Studio, in a, a mutual project. Um, so basically, our reasoning into that, why why did we in Sweden? choose to work with a museum lab in Pittsburgh rather than finding a consultant in Stockholm, uh, right? There are some IT people in Stockholm <laughs> <laughs> available. Uh, so I've been trying to kind of phrase why we did this, and it's, uh, of, course, of course, something you have to reevaluate every time you do a new uh, project. But basically, I think, also, when we are looking at like which consultants do we want to work with in, in Stockholm, we look for consultants who are willing to work on our scale. Usually, our digital projects have a budget of maybe ten or twenty or thirty thousand dollars, and most larger companies are not interested in that that scale. It's irrelevant to them. Um, so we need to find people who actually find that interesting, um, and. Uh, want to like dedicate their not only their time but be uh, uh, I'd like a buy-in into the uh, project in that size. Also, I think there w is a match in mission and values when you work together with another nonprofit. You do things in slightly different ways depending on how your bottom line is organized. Uh, so it's not all about money. Um, it's about building collaboration. It's about finding like joint interest in this. Uh, there are good consultants who can do this as well, but it's not 
like out of the box works every time. Uh, there are lots of consultants who frankly care more about the money, which they should do, because otherwise their company will not be there in 10 years, or five years, or one year. Um, so the consultants we find in Stockholm to work with are also more value-based organizations who select their partners uh, carefully, rather than only uh, caring about the bottom line. Um, so I think like the value match and the scale match was what uh, brought us into working together with the lab when we were looking for outside help in our digital products. Cool. Um, so uh, SFMM Lab isn't, you know, it's not a thing, obviously. Um, it's just made up. And it's not people. It's a set of practices. And so it changes shape and size depending on its need. And so there's people who are in conservation that are sometimes part of the lab. There's people who are in digital that are part of the lab. There's people who are in uh, collections information. There's people who are in interpretive media. And, it's an, and it, so it's not um, a destination as such. You can't attend it. Um, it doesn't have employees. Uh, so the KPIs aren't as obvious as a normal department. Um, so I would, I would put like on the, on the spectrum, like the lab spectrum, if you will, um, there is lab-like practices, and I think for most people in the room, um, except for maybe people in this quadrant, um, lab-like practices are probably the most valuable thing that you can take from a session like this, but also the most valuable thing that you can apply in your organization. Like an excuse to work at a different tempo on different scale projects with different outcomes that are largely not public facing. Like that's one end. I say SFMM Lab because we are kind of slightly branded is in the um, Cooper Hewitt Labs, uh, Australian Center for the Moving Image Lab. Um, they're kind of in, in that frame, like very close to being like vaporware, essentially, like vaporware with a name, but the name allows you to do stuff you couldn't do without the name. So like that's that part of the spectrum. And then moving up through, I think, organizations like um, the studio here where, where you're called a lab, but you do business that other organizations also do without giving it that name, but you're uh, like they're real staff with salaries and objectives, but you're not just a place for pure experimentation. So that's kind of, I would say, in the middle. And then to the right of that is uh, the Met Media Lab, which has um, gone away, um, or the, the DX Lab at the State Library of New South Wales is a good model. So dedicated staff, specific projects, outcomes, uh, KPIs, uh, budget. Um, that's not about simply putting on things a museum has to put on anyway. So like creating those new temporalities, but also resourcing them actively and then sharing and presenting. It's no good talking about it and not doing it. It's no good doing it and not talking about it. You've got to get that like happy medium of the, of the both. Um, and then there's other ones that are, I would say like a industry. So AAM, Alliance Labs, or um, another one I had is uh, the um, uh, the Center for the Future of Museums, that, um, the blog that comes out. So there's a few places where there's sort of um, a half-time person who's largely doing, um, um, what's the word when other people do the work and you just describe it? Settlers? No. Yeah, synthesizing what's happening elsewhere, but then making that available as a resource to people who don't have the time or the, uh, the inclination to go and gather that information. So. Uh, on that spectrum. The one that I would say um, where Patrick works is a sort of an, is an outlier to that, and that's where, um, where it's the IMA Lab, or Newfields Lab now, Newfields Lab has lived a number of different lives, and part of that, which sort of set it distinct, there's only a few places like this where they're, they're doing for-profit for projects out, outside, and I think that's a really interesting model, because that's actually much more like, a, like an agency, a digital agency within the context of a museum where one of your clients is a museum and you work for them for free, and then other clients you work for money. And I think that's, that's sort of one of the, like even calling that a lab is also like at odds with all of these other models. So like that's the landscape, that's a spectrum, and we're definitely, I've got a set of questions that I want to ask everyone else up here, but I'd prefer to start with your questions, and if you don't ask them, then I will. Um, and then I, th and, <laughs> and if we get bored, we're going to move seats again. So, <laughs> sorry, I warn you, if you're not asking questions, I'm going to make you stand up. Um, so, we're going to stop talking for a second and put your hand up if you're interested in some of these models or how they've worked or what we've learned. Um, otherwise, we're going to talk about some really practical stuff. Oh, that's a good sign. Um,
Just making sure you, you do you sit down when we're moving around, you're in a small to medium? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, for everyone who came in late, uh, people with lab practices are in this corner of the room. Uh, larger museums are in this part of the room. People in the back are small to medium in scale. Uh, if you're a vendor, you got to sit in the front row up, up here as well. <laughs> um, um, how big is your institution? What do you do as a primary um, primary thing? And uh, like, what's your audience mix? Yeah, I'm a, the American Civil War Museum in North Pennsylvania. We operate a free museum to the city of Richmond and Lancaster. Uh, we're about a three million dollar regular operating budget at the institution. Hmm. I have an idea. Mm -hmm. Free travelers. Free travelers. Okay, great. Um, so I just know that like companies like Google, they'll offer something to their employees called like 20% rule, where 20% um, of their time they can kind of be working on things that interest them. I think this is a really good way to just see what ideas your existing employees already have, just by giving them the time and resources they need. And it's actually pretty structured. You know, it's one day a week that they get to kind of forget about their normal job duties and uh, experiment with with their ideas. I would say at that scale and with the money that you've got, um, unless you get outside funding, unless so there's say there's someone deep pockets who wants to support the organization but it hasn't found a way to be engaged, um, then I would I would caution against making a lab with a name. I don't think that's necessarily going to help you. Um, but I would second Sam's approach, which would be, but I would like make it really practical and um, again like time box it and be really specific about the objectives. So it could be. Um, an area of the institution or um, part of your audience mix or a set of technologies or ideas, but you give it a framework and you're like, we're going to experiment with ways that people come into the building when they've never been before. Okay, and then we're going to do over the course of the summer, like this set of five people are going to do as many experiments as they can to a maximum of X number of hours they can dedicate to it with this sort of um, like business need but we're going to take a kind of we're going to take a kind of you know iterative lab based approach to it. We're not going to have any known outcome at the end. And so you basically like training wheels for um, is there an appetite for it? Can you do it well? Who are the right people who are going to self select into that group? And then if that works, then you do it slightly bigger, slightly broader. And you can also then have publishable outcomes that could lead to the pockets that get um, the deep pockets then allow you to do something more structured. So I'd say start really small with a in a defined both uh, set of concepts and time frame and people, and then see what the outcomes are and see if that's uh, a thing that you guys can become competent in. Thank you. Cool. I'm interested in the people who self-define as being in a lab or a lab-like situation mm -hmm. and whether everybody in that quadrant, do you agree with the definitions that were set out about what a lab is? Are there any characteristics of your situation that diverges from Cycles. Oh, sorry. Sure. Um, and it was created to push the way the museum works. So in that way, it, it we, we call ourselves an uh, incubator or a lab for new ways of thinking about photography and the photographic image. So yeah, all of the lessons that I'm hearing up here are what we're doing, but they, they manifest in lots of different ways. Yeah, I work with Sam at the Innovation Studio. Oh, I'm supposed to stand up, sorry. And I think the, the digital aspect to what we do is really only 50%. Um, the other 50% is uh, really focused on organizational change and adaptation and processes and workflows and inspiring that, um, that type of thinking throughout. We don't want to own innovation. We want to enable it. And I will stand up and use the mic. Um, I don't know who asked the question. But I also think that um, I the practices thing was a really good, I never would have thought of that word, but I think it's true. 
um, I just left an institution with um, that had a lab, and then it became like I used to say it was like a virus, because like all of a sudden people were like, hey, wait, we could do this too, and so it was started as a space, and then it became a lot of different things, and they seemed very disparate, but they all had the same kind of practice underneath, um, and so. I, the practice was like, a, it's a huge thing. It's like a mind shift that was incredibly important. Yeah, uh, for us, um, the practice um, theme sort of resonates with, uh, with us too. Um, um, we're, our lab is kind of a, um, a, kind of a virtual lab, but, but, but our curatorial team actually carved out a, a, um, a space. There was like a, this, um, this um, um, the, the remains of, a, of, an, of an airplane crash that was sort of parked in the corner of the collection warehouse. And so they gave us a space where we could start to do um, our, uh, some of our some of our 3D work, and so our our, our lab concept kind of grew grew out of that. But it's a but it's um, uh, people sort of fold into the team, whether they're from curatorial or from um, from uh, from conservation, uh, from our from our digital team. Um, so um, we're only we're actually only just at the process now where we're we're about to brand our lab as the Ingenium Lab or the Ingenuity Lab or something like that. But but um, one, of the, one other thing with our lab, and it's something I'm, I'm curious about, is um, a lot of our activity actually um, happens with, with outside people and also even in outside labs, like at Sheridan College's um, Cinematic Arts um, uh, Research Center. We've got a project on the go there right now. Um, so, so, do, so I'm just kind of curious even if people see these, these activities that sort of you know, cross over into other institutions, lab spaces, how they connect how much you, you see them as connecting to your, your lab endeavor. D does anyone, oh sorry. Yeah, just one last thing. Um, I work with Patrick in the New Fields Lab and I just want to, Kier mentioned that um, in general, the idea of a for-profit component in labs goes against what we think of as lab, but I just want to challenge that a little bit since we're embedded in the museum and so we get to do kind of innovative things for our museum, but then we're able to help other museums to do that too. So in a way, those who can't necessarily do the innovating internally, we can start taking that outside, but we're still very much embedded in that museum practice with the staff and curators. So it's an interesting model that we're still trying to figure out, but I'm hoping we can change that conception. And that commercialization model, I think, is, is kind of interesting because I, um, you know, projects that sort of come out of the labs quite often then just end up kind of dying over time. Like, you know, TAP, for example, kind of had a life and then it never really got picked up as an open source project. Mm -hmm. So how do we take those uh, things and, you know, is there any appetite to like essentially kind of maybe hand it off to a vendor and take a stake in the, in the company or how can we productize that stuff so the stuff that you guys are doing at the big organizations are made available to small historical societies and, and that kind of thing in a sustainable manner that will be here in 10 years' time. Yeah, I think that's interesting. I'll pick that one up. Because um, I don't think that's unique to museums. I mean, if you, if any of you guys have experience with JavaScript frameworks, I mean, they, they <laughs> come and go just yeah. as quickly as you can make them. Um, so, I mean, while you can make, we, we get these great grants to create these things um, for museums, and sometimes they may persist, and sometimes they'll be deemed relevant, and sometimes they'll die out because the technology is irrelevant, the concept's not relevant, and technology is changing at such a rapid pace. So it's interesting that you mentioned TAP, though, because we've looked at TAP, and we've looked at Tour ML, kind of the schema behind it all, and it's like, okay, well, maybe the TAP, maybe the front end isn't, isn't quite modern anymore, and maybe it's not as relevant, so maybe we can re-engineer that, and keep the bones of it, keep the foundation, because that seemed to be accepted and seemed to be, um, you know, people pick that up. But how do we, I mean, we have to constantly be in tune with the change and the rapid evolution and, and keeping pace with technology. Can I uh, yeah, jump yeah. in as well? I think what, what we need to, and this was briefly discussed, or it was discussed yesterday at the funders panel that uh, Jeffrey hosted. Um, I think it's really important to look at the, like what are the, the um, mission or the, like why do the different labs do their stuff? And uh, so basically if you do a one-off project, you always have your own museum as like the, the, the reason to do it. And to make these like cross-museum infrastructure things move forward, 
you need someone to take an ownership of that, and it's seldom possible to do that in an individual museum. Uh, so you, either you need to find a commercial partner to like take over, and then they can monetize it uh, and make it work for lots of museums, or you need, uh, like here, I suppose it's uh, part of the mission of the AAM labs to like have a good idea that works for one place. How do we transform this to use the infrastructure in more than one place? Uh, we're in the middle of this transition in Sweden where no, no one has really had the mission to do this cross-institutional mm. cross work. Um, so it was just recently reassigned to like the uh, heritage board in Sweden. And they have this <laughs> difficult task now of figuring out how to do this, starting from scratch with, uh, just like in most countries, I suppose, lots of different museums doing their one-off projects, and no one really has the mission to figure out how something is, can be replicated from one institution to another. Mm. I'd like to broaden beyond museums as well. I think it's a problem in libraries and archives, uh, galleries, all of the different metaphors, parks, etc. I'd also like to try and dispel the myth uh, with funders. I think it's, this came up yesterday, but it's something that I've, I've had a number of conversations with, um, especially institutions that are looking to join the funding or the foundation pool that support the glam sector. There is this perception um, that's d I just actually think is false, that they're going to be able to fund a thing that all museums are going to use. That's just, there's no there there. We, we've been successfully proved that we suck at that for <laughs> as long as there's been technology. So we, like, like there's very few things, like on that list, on that big long list, there are a bunch of JavaScript frameworks that millions of people use. There are no in cross-institutional museum projects that millions of people use. It's not a thing. I'll get off the soapbox now. So, <laughs> but you, it, the, there is a, a model where you can invest in commercial entities mm. to, to do that because we're probably better at getting to a wider audience and getting venture funding in a, in a, as a glam tech startup is is not a good idea. We've seen like you know the pressures of of normal investors mm. um, are not fit for the glam sector timescale. So actually, um, impact investing by museums into commercial entities might be a good way to go. Yeah, I, I, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's some interesting models that haven't been properly explored, and, there's, um, and I think it's going to actually come down in a weird way to personal relationships between people in institutions inside and outside the commercial and, and the, the sector, rather than, a, the, rather than like a, a, an established process like it is in, say, the, the university sector, where there's really good, deep, strong, replicable history of uh, professors and um, faculty taking ideas and productizing them and spinning out companies. Like there is teams of people at UC Berkeley, which is up the road from where I live. Like there's a whole division. There's like 22 people, I think, in, in it. And their job is to make companies out of the ideas of the IP of the professors. There's no equivalent in the museum sector. Like it's just not, we don't have, we don't have that muscle memory. We haven't learned how to do that. And maybe there's models we can, we can learn from elsewhere. The other thing I'd say is, um, uh, there was a really interesting discussion at a, a Bloomberg-funded event where <coughs> a whole bunch of Bloomberg fundees were in a room, and Aaron Cope, um, who is, was at the time at the Cooper Hewitt, just as the pen was coming out, and, and Shelley Bernstein, and something I w would have asked her to say, but I'm going to say on her behalf, um, who was at the time at, where was she before the puns? Help me out, Brooklyn. Um, and so it was just before ask, and so like they're pouring all this money in, and they're asking really concretely of the people in the room, we're giving you like X million dollars, how is the thing that you're making going to change how museums work in the future? And, and Aaron's saying in his sort of um, dismissive way, we're just going to open source it, and people will use it, and it's going to be amazing. And Shelley's saying in her really concrete way, that's bullshit, you're going to open source it, and no one's going to use it. And we're not going to open source ours because we can't properly support it. He's like, no, 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 just put it out. And it's, and I, I'd also disagree with that. It's like, just put it out. Like, there's some things that we've made that we could open source, but instead of open sourcing it, which which then generates work for you and generates work for us, where so I would say Semi SF Moment is a good example of this. Where instead we're open sourcing our time, and that's that's way more valuable to the people in this quadrant. Um, a little bit valuable here and something that we should be doing over here. Like open sourcing the code that you've made as part of this thing and give it, giving it away like is also a false promise. It's, n it's not an answer. 
it's the beginning of a conversation. You, you can open source it if you like, but if you don't follow it up with professional development, with collaboration, with transparency, with documentation of process, with the tools that you use to got there, get there, and the ideas that you're going to use to progress it, then you're not open sourcing it. You're doing something else. You're um, placating a funder. You're making something you can say in a, in a, in a panel discussion so you feel good. It's, I just, I, I'm, not, I'm not into it. And I'm, like, I'm speaking, in, this is Shelley's words, by the way, not mine. I, I believe in open source, <laughs> obviously. Um, uh, but what, so what we've done with Send Me SF Moma is we just, we just started contacting people who are contacting us and saying, if you want to do this, we will just have a series of meetings with you and we'll talk you through how to do it. And you'll do it with your code in your way, with your collections for your audiences. And you can have our code if you want, but we don't actually think that's going to really help. What's going to help is our time working with you so you can do the thing that's, that's right for your organization or decide not to do anything. Because that's, 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 that's the place that I think that, that labs can really get, is that we've got an excuse to do that. We're expected to do that now, because we've said that's what we're going to do. So, uh, very great stuff. I think you and I have had similar uh, reactions to some of this stuff. I think where I've landed on this <coughs> last thing, and we just sort of did it. With Glenn, uh, Glenn, uh, Glenn. Sorry, is good. this idea that labs are a uh, and you didn't say this, but I think there's sort of this current of labs are a cheap way to generate profitable products. And I, and I, you know, the, the practices that we do, I've, I say this all the time, is like, I don't have any intention of ever releasing this thing. What I want is for the staff to be exposed to it through the entire process. And then, like, you know, as a, as a silly example, I made like an Alexa thing, which I pretended was going to go into the Alexa store. I had no intention of trying to get it you know, past the curator and ex like that. But like I needed to sort of learn what this meant, what it meant to sort of make a, a dialogue like that. And, um, and so for me, it's like, it's like with the VR stuff and all that kind of stuff. Like to me, the, the, the work of the lab is to, is to infuse the institution with institutional knowledge that will be of use later. If we start trying to turn it into cheap product development, then I think we're, it's like the promise of open source being free work. We'll get other people to contribute, you know, which also never happens, right? So nobody ever uses your code and nobody ever contributes to it. But, but it, it, you know what I mean? Like, and so, yeah, I think it just stepped yeah. in just now with the, the <laughs> creation of product, you know, like, is that the goal or not? <laughs> Let's get back to the audience. Oh. Yeah, and, and, and where we can, where we can, if you've already spoken, like, I've got to do it for myself. If you've already spoken once, try not to speak again, try and make room for other people. That, that Jeffrey, you, you were already good. I, I wanted to say, I totally agree with you, Matthew. Um, but I think the 50% the balance is very important too because you, you, if you're a lab, you need to make work that has impact as well so that it, you know, everything we do goes to the floor. Um, and it's, it's at, when it becomes this thing that happens on the fringes with, that doesn't have a presence, that doesn't have impact, that, that's when it becomes seen as this frivolous thing that can be cut, that can be extraneous, not part of the core processes of the institution. No, I, sorry, I, I don't agree with that. I think like on the spectrum, as long as you're true to the narrative of why you have that practice within your organization, like if, you were, if the narrative that you are selling to your, to your boss and your boss's boss is that this is the way that we're gonna stay contemporary by letting, we're exposing certain stuff to certain things that we get in no other way, and like that's the narrative, then not making products and never hitting the floor is actually okay as long as you're like consistent in what you're saying and you're consistent in what you're doing. So for especially for the small to medium sector, they may, they may have a lab practice that never ever is visible and that's still valuable. Even if it's just exposing people to different actual working practices, that's still valuable in my opinion. I would say that you guys are saying sort of the same thing. We were talking about this in the failure situation. Part of it is about framing and outcomes. And so both of you are talking about outcomes. Your outcome happens to be a thing and yours happens to be a practice. But as long as at the beginning you frame it in a way that everybody agrees to, then you have a success. I think the real challenge we have is that we don't talk about those things in really concrete ways at the beginning. Amen. At the, at the back? I'm sorry, I'm coming late to the session, but I'm just curious. Um, you talk about internal process. How much of your lab uh, do you include external uh, stakeholders? Because when we talk about failing, um, when we open it up, there's more benefit to the community? I've talked a lot. So uh, 
So let me try and uh, repeat what I'm hearing. So how do we handle, when we have external stakeholders, how do we handle this concept of embracing failure? Or when? I guess when you're doing labs or prototypes, do you, is it only within the museum? Is it within your walls, within the curation? Or are you expanding it to allow material to propagate across or expand to other disciplines? Yeah. No, it's a very interesting uh, question you're asking. And I was thinking this in, in regards to, um, and maybe I'll take this to a, a broader response if that's okay. I think about w smaller institutions and smaller museums that maybe don't have the staff to support a lab. And so you have this, one of the themes that I've heard today is like, okay, well, we're gonna outsource it. We're gonna go to a design agency. We're gonna go someplace else and get people in to build it. And so they're gonna build us something and they're gonna deliver it and we're gonna launch it. But what happens when it breaks? What happens when we want to update it? What happens when we want to do all these things to it? Okay, we have to go back to them, we have to go pay them and get a new contract and do all that. So you lose all that. So the benefit of having a lab or having, even taking it further and saying like having staff that is technically knowledgeable, that is able to, to kind of go through the experiment of creating some of these things, they keep all that knowledge. That knowledge is now in your institution. Assuming you, you can keep these employees happy, keep them at your, institution and they don't leave, um, <laughs> which is a big, you know, you got to keep, <laughs> you got to keep your employees you happy. You yeah. <laughs> um, but that's a wonderful resource because then suddenly you have that and you have, if you have happy employees and they're given the ability to take 10%, 20% of their time to experiment with things, then they can grow and they can try these experiments and they can create a commercial product that they can ship off to, uh, you know, some of these external entities. They can create, you know, for us, creating an online collections thing. It's like, okay, well, we did it once for one place. We're going to do it again for another place. We're going to get better every time. There's micro things that we can change about it and have little failures internally, but still, at the end of the day, we're delivering a solid, you know, collections portal for this museum. And so that's something we can do and it's reliable. But it also frees us up to continue to grow and evolve as we create that internally and try new things, you know. Try and spin up the triple the IF server. Try and, you know, these new Google cultural, um, you know, links and new APIs and, and experiment with that. And it's all internal and we're growing and learning. So it's, uh, I'm on a soapbox here about this, but it's, it's wonderful to keep that in house and not lose that. So, so I'm gonna try and answer your question really directly. Um, all of the projects that we've done, we've had, uh, almost all the projects we've done, we've had someone outside as a, as a player, as a partner. Um, it's been kind of really intentional. And we've almost always tried to have two outcomes, one where we don't know what's going to happen that's sort of experimental, and then one that's foundational. So we, we're like not sure how that's going to work, but to get there, we need to, we need to build one of these, which is useful into the future. So it's also an excuse to build sort of uh, foundational tools for the future, whether they're processes, whether they're like APIs, whether they're like, oh, we now have, um, we did a project around color, and it kind of was a bit shit but we have color extraction for every artwork in the collection now. So we'll use that for something else in the future. We don't know what yet, because the thing we tried didn't work, but now we've got this sort of tool set, it runs every night, it goes and extracts the color from any new artwork that's been uploaded to the dams, and then it gets ingested into the API. Really helpful for this project that failed. So that's, kind of, that's, that's awesome, because we've now got more of the pieces of the puzzle so that, that we can then, when the next conversation, or the next opportunity comes up and someone's like, ah, oh, you know, like I'm really in a green phase, what have we got that's green? And you're like, I, w I can just bring that up right now because we've already done that. So uh, we're trying to do two, like we're trying to, we're trying to do that work that allows us to find that, that that messy, beautiful thing that's in between what we know and what they know. I think was that someone at the back? Oh, hey, hey, Rachel. Hi. Um, so I'm sort of like noodling through this, and I don't know that there's a concrete question as much as like an idea to put out there that I'm interested in hearing if anyone in the room has thought about. The thing, so as a, as a non-technologist person myself, um, the thing that I think is really interesting about lab practices in museums is sort of the mindset for experimentation and iteration that I think a lot of people are talking about in various ways. And I guess I'm, I'm sort of thinking about like what, like is there a way for that to be kind of the value that you start to spread to colleagues in other departments in other parts of your organization so that there isn't necessarily always the conversation about we need to have a product to make this lab stick around or we need to change this workflow to prove that the lab is not just a fringy thing. Like, 
I, and this is where it's like not really a clear question, but it sounds like um, a lot of the stories about, you know, when the Met Media Lab closed or when the New York Public Library's lab kind of shut down, there was a lot of this conversation about, um, you know, like are our labs doing anything or are they just people noodling around with wacky ideas that aren't useful, but it seems to me that the noodling around itself is a valuable mentality, especially in institutions that tend to not be very friendly towards noodling around and testing things out, and labs seem to be the place that might teach people to do that better. So I guess I'm kind of wondering for like anyone in the room, is that a part of what you have tried, or do you have thoughts on kind of the, the culture of labs being something that you're trying to spread across your institutions for its own sake. Can I just talk? I, that was my question, so I didn't want to talk a lot, but I did want I did want to ask that question. I think my response before was a response, but that was sort of my thing. Is that like to me, there's a bright line between <clears throat> good technology development practices, which is becoming more and more agile, more and more iterative, test driven, MVPs. That's not, that, that's not a lab. Hmm. That's just good practice, and I think like I'll, I'll tell you where I you know give you a, open the kimono whatever. Like I'm doing a lot of personalization stuff right now at the Museum of Natural History, and I find sometimes I'm running through this like ooh we'll personalize we'll make it do this for this class of person and things like that, and then I'm like, actually that's just good for everybody. You know what I mean? Like and so like I don't so I try to take it out of the pool of personalization. It's not like a gimmick. I need to like ooh I'll identify that you're here to buy tickets and I'll make it clear that skipping the line is a value proposition. Like, that's just a value proposition for everybody, you know? So, I mean, like, I would caution against leaving here thinking we need a lab in order to institute good practices around development of technology. Like, you should do that anyway. You can do all of this. That's why I sort of say the lab shouldn't necessarily end up with a profit motive or a product because then it can get dumped when you didn't deliver and then you lose all that learning. So if learning, and I, and I hear what you're saying about learning is a KPI for sure. So you just have to say that a lot and out loud. Do, do I have to make a question? <laughs> Neither of you made questions, but you made, both made really good points. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I, I think that's valuable. Actually, I have something to say about that. Um, I think that um, it's kind of silly to think that people aren't innovating and doing these kinds of iterative designs in their jobs, um, even if they're not working in labs. That's kind of like how, how we work. So. For me to say that the lab is like teaching people in the museum how to do that, I, it's that's hard because like it's just that's like that's how you work, you know. That's how, and we're all working together. <laughs> but it is like you can't say that they're not. I mean, people are making amazing things across the museum with and without our help, and um, so we do have an emphasis on creating a final product. And I think the idea behind that is that. Um, you know, with the noodling around, people can be very skeptical. And showing them that, you know, there's like a, a real reason to do it is definitely important. Um, and then maybe if there's still people who aren't, you know, following these practices, maybe then they'll actually buy into them. But I don't think you're going to get people on board necessarily if you're making stuff that, you know, they don't, they don't find impressive. So maybe the, the question here that we're kind of circling around is, um, you know, I, like uh, what Seema said earlier, she used the metaphor of a virus. And I think in a way, like the lab way of working, it's the opposite of the way that most museums and academic institutions work by default, where institutions are, you know, hierarchical. There's a sort of a pecking order. People are very siloed by uh, discipline. And I mean, that's good for certain things. but. Um, the whole, to me, the like lab way of doing things is an exact contradiction of that, 100%, a horizontal structure, a cross-disciplinary collaboration. But so the question is then, how do you, in an organization that works one way, how do you sell and convince people, actually, we should do things the exact opposite way that you've been working for the last like 150 years, like either in a subset of the group or in the entire organization, period. I, I guess I'd say that's the... The question, right, is how do you sell the labness, mm. uh, which which I would say is like a anti-hierarchical, you know, way of, of doing work in general, and and sell it in a way that makes it harder to cut and kill. Yeah, I think, exactly. and so there is, I mean, there's power and danger in monetization. You're protected if you're making money, but you're endangered if you don't make the money the right way and at the right tempo with the right outcomes. So there's 
and I think that's why the why the Vapor Lab, like SF Mama has, like Acme has, like Kupi Hewitt has, um, is is in some ways, um, and I think especially for this quadrant, more valuable because it's not a thing that the interested funder can walk away from and it disappears. It's not a thing that the director can change and then it disappears because it isn't it, it isn't the bottom line. It's a set of practices that 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 are horizontal and some institutions don't need a lab. Like it's actually SF Mama does not need a lab. We're we're pretty good at, at, at like sideways collaboration and we're way before I joined and will be after I've left. That's not an announcement, I'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> just, um, uh, but but what we did do is open up um, a set of dialogues that were unavailable to us as an organization within the Valley um, and allowed us to do work that we would have in no way otherwise been able to do that we've gone on to really connect with um, audiences on. So because there's, we've only got a few minutes left and there's like there, I think that we've been circling a question and you, you'll get to ask yours in a sec. Um, we've been circling a question and I think like the, the main part of this is is there something useful and replicable in my organization that would help me be successful, my colleagues be successful, and us change our practice? I think like around that is what we're looking like. Whatever the variable uh, manifestation of, of this set of ideas or practices, or whatever, comes out. So we're going we're to move chairs again. Um, if, if you're in a lab or have a, in a lab-like practice and you're thinking, you know what, this is silly and I don't need this anymore, <laughs> Then come over. Wait, uh, wait, wait, you guys are all that. Okay. Then you need to leave your little quadrant, and you're going to come over this side. So we're going to have this side of the room who thinks labs are vaporware and is a waste of time, and actually it's just about getting good work done um, iteratively and successfully. And this side of the room thinks there's a there is value in in a named entity within this organi within my organization that will help us do work we couldn't otherwise do. So we're going to split in half down the middle. Pro lab. Pro named lab. Own organization. Yeah, not generally. For you, as a practitioner, just just a lab, just your organization. No, 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 no. Have to go. <laughs> so, like, basically, in favor, against. For you, in your organization, it's so arbitrary. Oh, uh, yeah, Jeffrey. Whoa, that's big. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is, I'm having so much fun. This is great. In favor, Frith. Look at, oh, no, no, you're on the fence. Oh, I love this. So I guess the people are in the, who are right in the line here are like, maybe, no, not quite ready, not quite ready. People are standing at the side are like, I'm so into this. I'm, I'm like, I'm on the bell curve and I'm pushing it this way. This is amazing. Okay, up, like, which side, which side are you on then, Sam? Uh, I guess it might be the same and I'm on this side. Oh, boom. I love this game. Patrick. <laughs> All right, this is very hard. I think I'd honestly be down the middle because I think it really. Nope. No, no. There's no middle. There's no middle. There's no middle. Okay, then I'd be on the lab side <laughs> on that, you know, on the farthest row. <laughs> That's awesome. Man, I'm, I'm against that wall. I mean, I'm all in. Uh, like, we are trying to, to sure. move from that side to that side. We're not really succeeding at the moment. So that's why we trying to do it using external, like finding other consultants and people who are, appear like labs. And then we work with them and try to instill their practices into our organization. So I'll end up there eventually. Awesome. Hopefully. You can have a lab, but if it's just yours and name only and you have no friends, then you're not sustainable. <laughs> Mm. And you're not adding value to your community. So if you if you want real community, your lab needs to be open to other participants and cross-discipline participation. Yeah. Um, because ultimately, you'll just be another best kept secret within your museum, which you already are. So you already know that feeling. So. Yeah. So I'll stand up the, the, the my chair. No, and, you, and you risk getting cut. Without. I actually disagree. <laughs> I think that in some institutions that are embedded in silos, I think the lab is an impetus for all of the departments to work together because they say, 
oh, the Innovation Lab is doing really neat things, and we're part of that process. Mm -hmm. So I think it's pulling people in, and I don't necessarily think that that would happen without the lab or studio. Mm. When you make a thing, a thing with technology, 10% of your time from that point on, if you want that thing to survive, needs to be tending the thing. So if you're doing 10 things a year, you can't do anything the next year. You know, like, it's, it's attending, it absolutely attending. I totally but agree. But it's more process. No, and bringing I agree. people into the process. Yeah, yeah we, uh, the, reason why I'm the reason why I'm against this wall, and I started out against this wall when I, I moved to the United States, totally saw it as all vaporware. The reason why I moved to this side of the room and, and sort of pushing along is because everything about, all the choices we've made about SFM Lab within our organization have been with sustainability in mind and with about organizational change in mind, without processes that didn't exist, practices that didn't, glue that didn't exist. And so I, I, I don't think it's like the, the myth of the one person who's good at this is, is bullshit. And if you are that one person, then, and you're the only person who's driving it, then you're not good at it because you're not bringing people with you. So 100% agree. You have been waiting for ages, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Well, there's one really important feature of labs or a practice that we haven't talked about, and that's the radical transparency. They've got a blog, or they've got a medium, or they've got something going on. You need to have a name, so you gotta have it be labs, right? Um, that is an essential and important practice for me as an institution that doesn't have a lab. I've been reading you know, 17 different labs blogs for years, and that's helped me so much in articulating what the challenges are for a museum and where we need to go. So I wanna know about that practice of writing, who, like how much time is spent, some of these posts are really long, is, is that in your performance plan? Like where does that practice of mm. publishing outward with really good writing, good documentation of what you're trying um, fit into the, the set of practices? Yeah. I think what, what are you gonna call the blog? Yeah, yeah. well I think, okay, so how if, am you're I gonna, know it's for me? if you're gonna support this environment where you can noodle and you can experiment, you have to document, you have to put it out there and you have to write and you have to be transparent. I mean, it's something that, because you can't, you can't build stuff and if you live in your mind and, and experiment, you have to put it out there so people can see, even if it's a failed experiment, be like, wow, that's really cool. I didn't realize we had the ability to draw color from our collection with an API. You know, it, it, just putting it out there so people are, are exposed to what you're doing. I mean, one of the things with New Fields Lab that we're gonna start doing is just creating this kind of queue of medium <laughs> articles about, you know, we'll build this little thing. Maybe it's like a, you know, we have this graffiti exhibit where we put in all these real pay phones and we embedded um, Raspberry Pis in them to deliver audio. Just a simple kind of, you know, mechanical experiment that we did, but let's write a medium article about it. Let's put it out there, let's show people how we built it and, and you know, uncover and be transparent about what we're doing. Mm. I, so I, I, I'm a content guy first and like learn technology later. And so we, we think really intentionally about audience. And so um, when you're thinking about the move from like this quadrant to this quadrant, um, and you're thinking about publishing in transparency, think really intentionally about your audience. So for us, when we're publishing, our first audience is um, people who maybe don't trust this process who work for SFMOMA. So that's the first audience. And then the second audience is people who might want to work with us on things in the future, second audience. So it's, I'm going to send you, like someone contacts me, I'm going to send you a link to a thing that we've done that's like the thing you're talking about. And then the third audience is, you know, peers, whatever, and then general public. So like what, whatever that mix is for you, think of your audience and so write in that way. So be as dense or as light, be as technical or non-technical, put diagrams in, have videos, whatever the thing is. Um, I'm going to use Send Me SF Moma as an example. We, we did it and we put it out on social and people loved it, blah, 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 blah. Um, but the thing that made it go viral was that we wrote a series of like, how does it work? Why did we do it? Um, how long do we spend on it? Articles within the lab that journalists found. So we've got a bunch of journalists that follow our lab. Um, journalists found and then quoted from and wrote their own articles about the project and then other journalists wrote about those articles and then it turned up on the Today Show and blah, blah, blah. And so if we hadn't have done the work, there's no there there. If we hadn't have talked articulately about the work, no one would have discovered it. So it's a being able to ma marriage that. But, but the reason we wrote, the way that we wrote it was, I want to convince my colleagues that this is worth doing first and then, and then it echoes out and it echoes out and it echoes out. Sorry. So I just, um, we're, I'm, I work with Sarah and Diane and we're on this committee considering the lab because the institution, the Smithsonian has adopted this reaching one billion 
goal at the highest level, and it's, it's kind of a ridiculous goal, we know. Um, but for me, whether or not to lab is more, more, more important to me is that we infuse skills across the organization and a mindset that is, is user-focused and iterative, and whether or not the lab is the way to do that. Um, that, to me, is almost more core for a mm. behemoth behind top-down organization. So I'm, I, I think I'm still in the mindset of, like, is the lab the best way to do that? And, and what, do you have any thoughts about that? Like, I'm kind of Matt summed it up, and, and Sam did as well. Like, best practices are still best practices. Unless you're doing something, unless it's making space for you to do work that you couldn't otherwise do, I don't think it adds value. Um, so it, it, if you can't get the change or if you're not seeing the change and you're going to try this as a way of getting to that change, then by all means. Um, but it's absolutely not a, it's not, um, you know, it, it could easily be a thing that alienates people, it could make, it could be language that people feel um, is kind of uh, oppressive in a way, um, yeah, fetishistic, you know, like if you're trying to make like root and branch institutional change, I don't fucking like the lab's not a good idea, you know. Um, convincing the director to, you know, like taking everyone to project management school, fuck, spend money on that. Like take the whole organization to project management school. That's a much better investment than starting a lab. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't actually know how long this session's supposed to last, so we're just gonna say <laughs> it's over. I think it's great. So we've got a person standing with a microphone in their hand. Um, no one's freaking out. Let's do one question and we're done. Uh, these are just two quick things which I think are important from sort of maybe historical and also bringing in a perspective that I've heard in other sessions. One is, you know, museums actually have a good um, tradition of being labs also for the public. So the Exploratorium, for example, is a great example where their whole exhibition floor and that they invite people in to be part of this lab experience. And I haven't heard a lot of that, but I, I want to encourage you to think about that because um, even though it might seem like a territory invasion from the point of view of curators or other people who own public real estate in your museum, it's actually a good sustainability plan if you can do it the right way. So it doesn't become this, you know, um, self-defined, like, sort of thing that only the <coughs> club members belong to this lab. Okay, second point is, um, and, and that comes from my background as an educator. The second point comes from my background as a uh, leadership position in institutions that some of you have mentioned, uh, MetLab being one of them. I ran the group that preceded the MetLab, and um, we never called ourselves the lab. We lived in spaces that people discarded, but we didn't have money to renovate, so it felt like you were in a lab. Um, <laughs> and uh, we, we actually worked, you know, as we all do for exhibitions and other things, like very closely throughout the museum, and as soon as they restructured and put all of those people in one group, it became a target. And I just want to say that you know, we live in uncertain times. And I, I think that it, the more we can get our work done, um, you know, maybe this sounds like a little bit of like uh, retreating, but the more that we can get our d work done seamlessly, like connected to what other people are doing without creating a, a, a physical place, I think the more likely we're gonna get more progress. So I see that the lab, the, the creation of a lab as this independent thing that develops these great ideas, it's all good, but I think institutionally sometimes it just feels like I don't have that to the people who are not in it. So anyway, just putting it out there. A healthy word of caution to end on. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah.